Hey everyone, welcome to the Q-Pod. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. This is episode 46. This is Super Bowl weekend. Super Bowl 58, Dave. Yeah. I know exactly the number because every time the Super Bowl happens, it's my my age, 58 years old. So. Um... Oh, that's awesome. I've seen every Super Bowl. <laughs> uh, actually, every Super Bowl since Super Bowl II, I've seen. <laughs> Uh, I can't claim the same, so I don't. Rem- I might have, but I don't remember. I don't probably- think Super Bowl One was on TV, was it? I don't I'm, know. Maybe I, I'm not sure. But to get the Niners, obviously Bay Area here in Silicon Valley, huge push. People are pumped uh, again. Um, they haven't won since 1994, so they're hoping to bring back the glory. Um, Jim Harbaugh was there. Um, Kyle Shanahan, I think, was at one. I think Jim Harbaugh was was Kyle Shanahan, and then Jim Harbaugh made it to him, but. Um, it should be good. How are you guys feeling out there in Silicon Valley about the uh, Niners' chances? Well, you know, I'm a turncoat, so Patriots fan. Given the NFC and AFC don't compete, I love the Patriots first, Niners second. Um, but people are jazzed up. I think they think it's the better team. But they're always worried about Mahomes and Kelsey. If they show up, that changes the dynamics. And I think, you know, their line and their defense played well last week. So, you know, anything's possible. But I think last year I was in Philly with Paul Martino, uh, for the Eagles and, you know, Eagles look good and they just, it was a, a last minute ending, weird ending and they lost. So anything's possible with the chiefs. And that's the feeling generally here, but people are pumped. You know, it's, it's yeah. Super Bowl. And, I, I, and, and there's, and there's two types of pumped, right? There's the, the fans who actually want to watch the game. And then there's people who have parties who happen to have a game on. And so I tend to be hardcore on these Super Bowls when I like the team. So I don't want to go to the parties at that where people like want to talk to you. Hey, how's it going with Silicon Angle? Like that. Stay away. I want to watch the game. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> you <know>? <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's Holy. going on? What's new? What hot stars have you seen? Oh, sit down. I don't want to talk. Can I just get another beer and watch football? Thank you. I like the Niners. Um, I think they're going to win, but I bet a whopping $50 straight up on Kansas City because it was just better odds um, and Mahomes. But I'm, I'm going with the home team. I, even if but I, I, I kind of am rooting for the Niners. <laughs> I, I, you know, because you know why? I, it's weird. We people around New England, we have this weird thing. We don't want Mahomes to catch up to Brady, so we kind of always root against them. But you gotta, you gotta be. I, mean, I know it's weird, isn't it? But well, we but, got uh, a great pot here, Dave. I was like last week, we couldn't make it because I was at Pebble Beach with um, um, golf and opportunistic uh, biz dev and and content acquisition. Some great stuff down there with SaaS, Cisco, a bunch of companies down there. So, um, but we got Sanjay Poonin coming on this podcast so he'll come on um at uh in a few in a few minutes as we get why what's he been up to <laughs> yeah you know he left the m where he was doing all those m a deals he did air watch remember his career we've been following him since sap good friend of you yeah um took over cohesity i think at a time where he thought he had more meat in the bone but as the market changed cohesity i, th- I think in my my opinion you have probably more data um i know you do but i i've been seeing some of the results that the market's shifting right so Cohesity, you know, was doing okay, but not super great from what I was hearing. And again, the PR guy who was over there before was kind of went cold silent on us. And and I think he then moved on. But the point is, is that they weren't really talking to us. And I felt they were kind of bunkering down. Sanjay was beavering away. My guess was he was organically trying to figure out the growth and then looking at M&A and or sale options. I've heard that there was, you know, looking for partnerships. I wrote on my post and then retracted it because I said that they were trying to sell it. Yeah, and why'd and, you retract it? I mean, there was a, there was strong rumors that they were trying to sell the IBM. I heard they talked to Cisco. I heard they even talked to Rubrik. Yeah, so that's true. I couldn't prove that they were in a selling process. So I brief wrote they're looking for a strategic <laughs> partnership, which is you know you float the trial balloon by as everyone knows how it works. The code is if you're in a sales process, you're like we're selling the company, and that's what they're not they're not doing that. Um, but they were definitely floating it. Do we sell or do we merge? I think they were think, looking for strategic alternatives, right? I mean, they get to get to, to to get to escape velocity. You got to have it's going to be a billion dollars plus. I think that's what this is about. But uh, we'll ask. No, I, I don't think it's. I think it's about the fact that they, they couldn't find a dance partner that was better than Veritas. So I think what Veritas, Veritas, you have the data. I talked to Rob Stretchy about this and the research team about the spending velocity. Their spending momentum wasn't that strong. So uh, that's an understatement. Their spending velocity, at Veritas, was was really crap so um, they got this they got so you but they got a huge install base so sanjay yes, is an exactly. consummate deal maker so he goes okay they have hardware he's got hardware veritas doesn't they got 
combined combined together it's a brilliant play and you know it's all about if they can pull it off zeus's post was good but he's also he's skeptical he zeus is skeptical of all deals and we know that but his, his, his analysis was good can they pull it off but Sanjay's done this before. We've seen it hit VMware at Airwatch. So, uh, you know, when he comes on, we're going to pepper him with questions. Let's ask him the questions if they were selling or not. I mean, we all know how it works in Silicon Valley. Oh, I'm not for sale. Bullshit. You're selling. Uh, and, well, I just think they were, I think they were looking for options. And they, and they ended up, you know, with the one that got them to be a bigger company. I think they, and what is it? It's yeah. a $7 billion valuation, but a lot of debt they're taking on, right? They're taking on a couple billion dollars in debt. Well, the, com the combination is an instant company. If you look at cohesively how big they're going to be overnight, Dave, this is a serious deal. I like the deal. I mean, I'm one of the, I think maybe the only ones that likes the deal. But no, no, wait, they're going to triple in size, right? That's a, yeah. I think that's a good thing. Now they got to manage that. They got to figure out what to do with the various roadmaps and the, the Veritas install base, which is pretty entrenched. Are they going to give net backup customers yeah. a, a path? What does that look like? We'll ask them. Cisco announced uh, layoffs. Thousands of workers are being laid off. Um, we talked to some folks at Splunk this morning. They're going to be part of that, probably layoff as well, but they didn't tell me that, but I'm guessing it. They're nervous uh, in general. So we're going to see how Cisco evolves with Cisco Live coming up in North America. They just had Cisco Live in Europe, you know, um, just recently. Uh, obviously, we're, we've been covering them like a blanket. Um, we'll see how, what the, how that shakes out. But, you know, people are cutting the fat. Your storage had a huge earn, a layoff. About 250 to 270 people in pure storage were laid off. And uh, from my sources, what I'm hearing is, is that that layoff was to really, really good people. Some solutions people, field people, um, um, flash blade, AI group people. So, and, and, and the story there is interesting. And, and, and the rumor, I got some validations, but I don't have three sources, but pretty much solid. That it's the classic case of, in order to get budget, you got to cut someone. And you see this in companies all the time, Dave. You know, we talk about it all the time for companies that are bootstrapping. Hey, if I want to get that extra head or fund that project, I got to get that money from somewhere. So I got to cut something. So that's what's going on up here, Storage. They've got the moonshot. They want to be the SSD player. You know them very well. Um, well, that can I comment is... on, let me comment on the um, on the layoffs, if I may. Yeah, please it, do. It, it actually is working for earnings. I mean, look at Amazon. Jassy cut, right? And Boom, look at what the earnings were last week. Yeah. Look at Meta. It was like last year was the year of austerity. Meta is out kicking ass. Their, their valuation's now back up over a trillion. The only one that yeah. really hasn't, Microsoft hasn't had to as much, but Google really hasn't gone on an austerity program. I, I wonder what you make of that, John. It's like, you know, the, the, the street probably, the street loves when people do layoffs because it drops right to the bottom line and you got AI yeah. and you're, you're doing all this productivity. Google hasn't done it, so they continue to just like ignore the, the, the cat calls from the street and double down on technology. You wonder, is long-term, is that like re a really good play? Or do they maybe pull the trigger down the road um, and then there's like a huge upside to Google? Or I think, do they just keep I think their head in the sand? No, I, I think Google doesn't operate that way. Google has natural churn. They kind of force people out and shut down projects. So it's not what like do you a mean? What do you mean by like that? Explain that. It's not like a layoff. So, so what they, do they do? They have a lot of moonshots. They have a lot of stuff that's going on. So I'll give you an example. Let's say they have a project. They, they're you know making self-driving uh, sauce flying saucers or drones <laughs> to deliver <Okay>. packages. <laughs> They'll have saucers. like hundreds of people working on that, and they're like, okay, that's over. Okay, so they and then they just cut it. And when they cut it, those people are gone, and they have to find jobs within the company. So it's not like a mass layoff, like we're cutting, like like a Cisco's announcing. That's broad stroke. And so that's that. And then people leave Google if they're not happy. So Google's one of these places where if you want to sit there and 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 twiddle your thumbs, you probably can get away with it. And most pe the people don't do that. So that's kind of how how they are. But Google's rich. They got great cash flow. Their earnings, they got Alphabet. They got Google Cloud. So um, Google's just a different animal, I think. So I, this is a different culture. It's interesting. So anyway, the... Um, Speaking of Google News, um, Dave, you know the big story is their new, their their rebranding of Bard. Okay, so that that's a great pivot to, to Google's Gemini uh, project. So basically, Bard was took Duet, so they got Duet, Vertex Duet AI infrastructure products mm -hmm. are branded as Gemini now. So and they're going to charge for that, right? They're going to they're going to. Yeah, they got to pay for that now, right? You got to pay for Bard or Gemini, or, right? So well, you, and it's also the branding integrating everything. So first of all, the Bard thing is gone. That's that they're renaming. Right. And so, so what are we paying for now? We're paying for ChatGPT. If you want 
4.0. You're paying for perplex, perplex. We pay for perplexity, right? You got to pay for that? No, I don't, I don't pay. I use the no? free version. Is there a paid version though? What? There is a paid version. I haven't used it or tested it. So I don't, I don't know. And then I, and then you can pay, you can pay for Google now. So there's like three of them like, and, and maybe there's more. I don't know. Yeah. I oh. mean, they, they got their own LLMs and we'll see how it goes. So that's, that's big news there. That's going to dominate my opinion, Google next, which is coming up in April. Um, so Google's working on that. So I expect that to be a big, big story. What else is going on this week? Sam Altman news. We're going to get into that. Huge yeah. news. Huge news. Let's let's get into it. So, so, and by the way, there's a lot of other stuff going on. Open AI, Meta, Meta spelled their 20th uh, birthday. There's some great photos on my Facebook feed from people that were there when they were 30 employees. So all, all good. Let's get into Sam Altman and the chip. So there's a couple of stories here. Let's talk about the chipping away at the future here. Um, you have, you got Sam Altman in the news. You got you did a, just did a breaking analysis on on Intel. Nvidia is forming a unit designing custom chips. It's funny, Dave. We we talked about this at reInvent. It's a chip war, okay? And and everyone wants their own chips. Um, and yep. and and the Nvidia is targeting very interesting thing. And and we put a post up. Uh, actually, Zias wrote a post. Zias Carvalho wrote a post about Equinix and um, and Nvidia. So NVIDIA is getting traction with their DX Cloud, and 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 rumor has it that Amazon and and NVIDIA are at odds a little bit there. So look at look at NVIDIA making their moves. So that's the NVIDIA forming their own chip unit. You talked about Intel, their own foundry, and then the Wall Street Journal has an exclusive where they had quote sources colon Sam Altman talking to investors such as the UAE governments to raise five trillion, five to seven trillion. For a project that would boost the world's AI chip building capacity. Okay. I have never seen a headline with the T in it ever in my life. That's Isn't that first, unbelievable? That is the that... first time I have ever seen the T in a freaking headline. I woke like, up this morning for that. Me? I had to like, rub my kidding? eyes and go, what? Is that five to seven? Did you say trillion? Is that, is that a terabyte? Is that, is that terabyte? That's supposed to be 50 to 70 billion, but wow. Yeah. And you know, I just I just had Ben uh, Barahan. Barah, is that how you say his name? Ben Bar, bar, it's spelled Barajan, Barahin, yeah. Ben Barahin yeah. on, and he's like, knows the space. And I was asking him about a chip manufacturing capacity. He said they're, they're maxed out. It's absolutely like totally maxed out, which is good news for Intel because that could help save them. But, but to the point, so I've been saying this, the CHIPS Act is 50 billion. It's just like a little tinkle in the pond. <laughs> right. And so, so Sam tinkle, Altman, tinkle he's saying it's like five to seven trillion. And that, it's a, so yeah. Intel's building like six new fabs. And Pat Gelsinger said a new advanced fab costs 30 billion to build. That's $180 billion. So he's going to get what? 10 billion from the US. He's going to get 10 billion from the EU. So he's got 20 billion. Where's he going to get the other 100 to 120 billion? It's not going to come out of cash flow. So that's why this really caught my attention. I mean, Five trillion, and that's that's what this needs to to actually solve the problem. I mean, it's yeah. going to be it's going to it's not fifty billion is not going to do it. Yeah, and and you know, I would never I never thought about this before, and in, in in saying and saying it out loud, I thought about it in my head, but never thought I would utter it in in public. Never mind on on a podcast or on on the queue. Is that you know you're talking about scarce resource at this point? You know, water chips you know there's a real threat to the economy and the world you know we don't if we don't have enough chips when there's so much momentum think about the pressure that puts going to put on society if the, if the appetite and the and the drive to drive more computing power um water electricity power chips man it's unbelievable if you just this puts things into perspective and for you know, as as uh, Kara Swisher calls the Silicon Valley, the backwater of tech. You know, only these conversations were happening in the backwaters of the of, right. the of the elite when people were talking about building fabs and and building chip centers around five trillion dollars. To to have it out in the open like this, really mainstream, points to the societal change, Dave. And this is like why I think AI is so exciting on the one hand, and um, you know, scary on the other. Where does this go? Does it slow things down? And what does the entrepreneurial equation look like? What's the future entrepreneur look like? What does the next, you know, um, you know, Bob Noyce look like? What does Gordon Moore, the future, look like? These are the uh -huh. pioneers of semiconductors. Interesting. Well, what, what all is, been 
seems like he wants to be one. And then the, the other angle there with with well, his, his, he gets dinged all the time. He's not a techie, they say. He's more of a oh, well, he's, you know, he's a visionary. He's, he's a visionary. I mean, but, he, more of a but he but he but he's tapping man. the UAE, which is really interesting to me because you know the oil kings they want in on AI. You know we know that from our sources who spend time over there, and you know they they're looking a you know, hundred years out and saying okay. You know, it, and they know semiconductors are the, it's like the, the mainspring, right? That's like oil. You own <laughs> semiconductors, you can control things. And so now the speculation was, well, maybe the U.S. won't let them, but the U.S. 50, 50 billion. I mean, that's not going to do it. So yeah. I like the idea of the U.S. kind of belling up to the UAE, figuring out how to fund this thing, getting manufacturing, you know, it's, it's you know, 80, 90 percent now is Asia, 90 plus percent of the yeah. Leading edge manufacturing is in in you know Southeast Asia. Get that back to 50 50 50 percent outside of Southeast Asia. That's what Gelsinger wants to do, and I think I think it's going to take trillions to do it. Maybe not five to seven, but you know one two three trillion. That's the way to think about this. So I threw a little troll or like a haymaker on Twitter, recycling a clip from the Cube, where we pontificated an idea and put a question mark out there and. I think I remember the conversation of will Intel go bankrupt? Um, I got a lot of great responses. Are you kidding me? So again, the point, I mean, we talked about this in the pod a bunch of Why months. do people say you're kidding me? They no. got, where are they going to get $180 billion to build so, six factories? So I wanted that's, to bring I wanted to that's bring that's not inconceivable, John. I wanted I wanted to bring that back up because Dave, we talked about this as a riff and we were speculating and talking, connecting dots on this point. What do you think? Is that still even possible or is that just still hyperbole over the top? Ben, who knows this space, he's actually optimistic about their foundry chances. And what he said was, number one, they created separation between the, the manufacturing and then Intel's own design. So they created a Chinese wall to allow the foundry customers to have confidence that they wouldn't be taking their secrets and giving them over to Intel chip designers. The second thing is, he said, look, they, they're on their way, you know, four nodes in five years, that whole thing that Pat always talks about, and they seem to be getting there. They're they're using this ribbon FET or technology yeah. and trying to leapfrog what you know uh, uh, TSM is doing. Yeah. They're finally using EUV, but they're six to seven years behind. So anyway, he feels like they got a shot at yeah. being you know a reasonable number two. But my question to him was still like, okay, but how do they throw off enough cash to fund all the foundries? And he didn't really have a he, his answer was they can't do it alone. But my yeah. point is the government. 50 billion and they're only going to get a piece of that and maybe 10 billion from the EU. There's no way that's going to yeah. fund and they're not going to throw enough cash off out of their, their core X86 business and foundry is, is not profitable. And the foundry is a hard, really hard business to make money at even TSM. I mean, yeah. they, they, they make money. I, I mean, I got it in front of me. TSM is like a $68 billion company. You know, their growth rate is flat because they can't make any more. They got a 57% gross margin, which is good. Their free cash flow margins, like, you know, you know, 10% on 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 70 billion. I mean, it's not like yeah. the greatest business in the world. And, and so yeah. how's that going to throw off enough cash for Intel to fund six new factories? I I don't know where the money comes from good, other than massive subsidy. debt. And our subsidy government. Oh, is what U.S. taxpayers? I mean, what right, so thirty-three trillion in debt let's, already? Let's, let's, well, let's talk about trillion. So let's get back to the, the trillion-dollar baby here with, with <laughs> OpenAI and Sam Altman. So seven trillion dollars. Okay, that's like what Apple, Microsoft, Amazon uh, combined in terms of market cap. Maybe what twenty percent of the GDP. I mean, D Dave, this is incredible. You know, I you know it's insane. So, but so, but 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 it's it's telling though, right? It underscores. So, what so, this is going to take. So there's, there's no way the government could subsidize that. Again, and, and by the way, he calls it networks, a network of fab factories, not just one. So it's like a series of ways to build chips. Uh, we'll dig into it more, but this is just a sign of the times. And again, back to the resource piece. You know, to me, you know, there's like energy involves, of course, you know, people trying to get out of the so, oil business so, or trying so, to get into the, you know, if you're in the oil business, okay, hmm, what's the next oil? So, it ain't John, data, it's AI, but it's also chips. John, the 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 Department of the U.S. Department of Defense's budget is less than a trillion. Okay, think about that for a second. So, the military can't fund what's necessary, right? The U.S. government's got thirty-three trillion dollars in debt. Well, maybe the DoD should shift their focus to chips because it's an it is a national um, 
security challenge. And hey, look what comes out of funding. The, the whole Cold War funding pretty much funded DARPA. You know, all that uh, research grants um, helps fund innovation. So, you know, maybe shift it a little bit over. Okay, I mean, so maybe they can kick in, I don't know, 100 billion. It's still, it's mice nuts in terms of, that's what, that's what Altman's gambit here tells me is that that's the kind of thinking. And so he's looking ahead saying, wow, we just don't have enough chips to power right. the AI right. era to get to AGI. Of course, he's got a Jones to get well, to AGI. I'm maybe, not sure I want to get there that fast. The, the chatbot market's maybe more valuable than we thought, Dave, to run chatbots. Well, I mean. <laughs> Only kidding, I guess, honestly. <laughs> I, I, I get, well, no, I was going to say, well, Microsoft's valuation went up a trillion dollars last 12 months and uh, their revenue grew 23 billion you know, they, they trade at 10 times revenue. So that's 200 billion, yeah. I mean, the rough numbers. So that's $800 billion yeah. of value associated with AI. I mean, I think, I think so. the innovation, this is crazy times. And, and it's, when, I, when I look at this, I brought up earlier the entrepreneurial equation because the entrepreneurs are the ones going to solve these problems. I'll give you an example. Remember back in the day when memory was like 8K, 16K, um, you, that, had to swap the disk. So I think there's, there's a lot of <laughs> aging and, and yeah, all Work kinds day, of, I remember. So, so I think the constraints <laughs> always shift. And here the constraints are power, um, on the, uh, certainly for the power that's, and the chips themselves and the supply of the chips. So what you're seeing in open source right now with the LLMs and the foundation models is a great use, use case. All the big guys with their proprietary models, OpenAI, Anthropic, and everyone else, they were proprietary dedicated LLMs. Open source is now almost caught up to that. And that's why I think the the law and what Meta is doing is interesting. So the question is, is this real? And can that be solved? So I think the entrepreneurs out there uh, will invent something that will solve this. And I think that's where the, the geeks are going to work on it because the market's too big. The fact that they even thrown on the numbers means that uh, the TAM is pretty strong to, to go after this. And if you look at the data, I mean, I'm seeing an article here that just hit from Financial Times. Uh, OpenAI's annual revenue hit two billion in December, up from one point three in October. Maybe, and, then, and then look at that, aiming to double that figure in twenty twenty five. So, you know, in one year, it's a two billion dollar business. Cash Dude, talk about off the shelf spending. Uh, I mean, off the chart spending data. OpenAI hit the scene out of nowhere, and it's it's it had it blew past anything I'd ever seen, even Snowflake, which had, when it came out, it was off the charts. And it's sustaining. I mean, its lead is so far ahead. All those other names, when you see the spending data, Cohere, Anthropic, you know, Llama 2's coming in, but OpenAI has just got this huge lead, which of course I said was not sustainable. Uh, that prediction's not looking too good. I'm, I'm is really it? happy. I'm looking good on my <laughs> prediction on that one. I got that one right. <laughs> I get a lot of predictions wrong, folks. Don't yeah. don't go to. Don't go to the bank on my predictions, okay? I mean, I, mean, I, I get a lot right too, but I, I definitely be careful. Get, I definitely get most of mine right. So if whatever I say, well, probably will happen. So I would bank on those and put all your life savings <laughs> on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's the disclosure? Don't, this is a show, not a financial advice. Right. Um, be careful yeah, listening yeah. to us. We we, we, <laughs> we make, no, we're being humble. We're pretty good. We make pretty good predictions. Let's face it. We're not... We like to we, do pat okay. our, we like to pat ourselves on the back. We're pretty much better than anyone else out there on that front. Um, oh, relatively speaking, John. I mean, I was just talking about you know trying to be yeah you know, honest on our binary. Actually, I did okay on my predict. I get a consistent B plus on my predictions. Uh, I can't I can't crack the A well, ranks. The, well, you well you well you go narrow. I mean, the thing about the predictions is if you try to specifically predict something to happen do. specifically, which you do, it's hard to get those right and. The, the, to me, what we, we've been focused on, you and I, since 13 years working against Silicon Angle on the Cube, is we get the trends right. Because the, the waves, almost to me, it's about the waves and then how you ride those waves. Uh, I was joking with uh, the founder of uh, Kong, came in the studio, and he's like, yeah, if you, we were in the right wave, but we didn't have the, we had the wrong surfboard, was his analogy. And he said, once our team realized that we were on the right wave, that was a success for the startup. Then they just realized they had to get a bigger board, and they they manufactured that. They did that. It's called API um, proxy, it's an API server, and so that's what this is. Where what we do, and I think to a lot of companies and startups they get caught into the mechanisms what they're building. They don't realize: Am I in the right market, the right wave, and is it a good wave? And what do I need to ride the wave to survive, and then keep 
getting the board better and adjusting. So the AI wave is massive. Um, the infrastructure side's massive. We're covering it, seeing all the data point to it from the changing landscape of media, the layoffs. Um, I think last podcast we were on, you and I talked about John Chambers' famous quote about transitions. And I think, you know, it's guys like Sanjay Poonin, for example, we're going to have on shortly, who is an M&A king. He's so strong at M&A because he can see product holes and he can make decisions around organic versus um, uh, non-organic growth and knows how to fill that void. So He's an yeah. impressive guy. I'm, I'm psyched that we're getting him on. I, I love Sanjay. Uh, yeah. But it's su such energy and, and, and he's clarity. A, he's a media hound too. He likes to come on camera. Totally. That's why we love him, <laughs> Cube. Yeah, we are too. Uh, so yeah, I can Earning, say, oh. earnings are out there. What's your general consensus? What do you, I know you had a big um, Amazon analysis. We had arm came in this week. Cisco's coming next week. Um, what are you seeing for earnings? I, you know, what, I, what's happening? I what's love happening? Amazon right now. I think, you know, Jassy, people were calling for Jassy's head several quarters ago. And you, of course you and I laughed at that. I mean, we knew he was going to get his arms around this thing. So he's got, you know, he's got a, Pumping on a couple of cylinders. Obviously, the retail business is going really well. He's got that advertising is starting to to crank up. Have you um, have you been hit up for your Amazon Prime ad free? Yeah, I did have. you? No, I did didn't you? click on it yet. Will you do it? You think? I'm not sure. I kind of I'm off put by that. To be honest with you, I think that's I know, but you know, it's but, like I, but I but I bet you we end up doing. If the ads get too annoying, you're going to do it. I bet. The streaming, um, the streaming services, in my opinion, generally suck. Okay, compared to broadcast television, there's all kinds of buffer loading errors. It's just like bad PC management. It's like, but you know, it's streaming. You know, it is what it is. I'm not a big fan of the tech. I think the guides could be better. There's a lot of cross API credential sharing. That's different, different plans. Um, so I'm not a big fan of the streaming as a cohesive user experience. I love the direction. Don't get me wrong, but not a big so fan. So Amazon, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about. I think they're they're back. And a couple of things, uh, Jassy said that cloud optimization has attenuated. I love that word. And I tweeted out, the data shows that. In January, 2023, 19% of the customers that we surveyed with ETR said that cloud optimization was the primary way in which they were going to moderate costs. And that's down to 7%. Yeah a year later. So that's clear evidence that it's it's waning. It's still there, but it's but it's it's lessened. And so now and the other thing we see is when when Bedrock went GA um in September-ish time frame, October, we're seeing an up uh, you know a tailwind from that. And so Amazon's got I think look, I mean, you can say what you want about Titan, maybe it's not like the leading edge uh, large language model. So what? Doesn't have to be. Amazon can offer a lot of different language models and the surrounding tools and capabilities are going to give them a lift. Mm -hmm. So I really like Amazon right now. And Microsoft's Microsoft, you know, they kind of came in where everybody expected, which was awesome. And they did that. Yeah. I think Google was a little somewhat not, disappointing. And there's just like, okay, you're the AI leader. You know, where's the AI boost? And everybody's freaking out. You, you, you li I listened to the call the other day. I wasn't on it but I listened to it in replay, all the analysts cared about, all they wanted to talk about was how advertising was going to get impacted by the perplexities and the chat GPTs. I mean, that was their focus. I mean, they were just pounding Sundar, you know, with those questions. They didn't even, they didn't even hardly talk about GCP and GCP's growth is, eh, yeah. it's mad. They're, they're like a distant third still. So it's hard to get too excited about Google, but if they cut costs, like we're saying before, that could be pretty interesting. And then Arm this week, Arm absolutely crushed it. You know, Arm's a company with nearly 100% gross margins because they don't they don't make anything. They just, they create an architecture and license it. And so Arm's uh, valuation shot up. I got I got it right here. I was I was shocked when I looked at it. I was like, holy cow, their, their valuation is now, as of midday today, it was 115 billion, 38 times their $3 billion revenue. I mean, they're they're closing in on Intel. I mean, <laughs> Intel's got a hundred and eighty-three billion dollar valuation. TSM six ninety, Nvidia one point eight trillion. AMD's got a two hundred and seventy-eight billion dollar valuation. You know, way higher than Intel's. 
and 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 they're like half the revenue, less than half the revenue. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. really pretty I mean, interesting what's going on there. Yeah, and 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 Meta had a big announcement. Their their earnings were all through the roof. They're oh, now worth Meta point, crushed it. Then they're, they're now on one point two trillion dollar valuation. Zuckerberg's wealth reached one hundred and sixty five billion, personal record, due to the stock's rise of twenty two percent. Every time Meta gets crushed, I look at it and say, two billion active users. Right? <laughs> How do you compete with that? They all, they'll always find a way. And it'd be interesting to see with the metaverse, just you know, all the Apple Vision Pro talk this past week was 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 hot. But you know, Meta's there too. I, I don't know. I'm not a big Vision Pro guy. I kind of well, not into the Meta. Meta is a money machine. I remember a friend asked me, I won't say his name, but should I buy Meta stock? Was bottoming out. I said definitely buy it. Um, I said, well, he goes, why? They're getting killed. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a money machine. They got Instagram. They got connected all together. He did. He's happy. Now, do you remember? Uh, do you remember we were at Oracle Open World years ago in the little mini Q logic cube? Remember that? We used yeah. to sit like this in yeah. a little 10 by 10 space. Yeah. And Facebook got crushed. Um, and we yeah. interviewed Benny off. You did. It was amazing. And then we we went back and forth from the studio, well, the, mm -hmm. the Q logic studio on the floor. And I remember Facebook stock got crushed that week. And you and I were talking about it, and you were like, it's a screaming buy. Yeah. Um, well, well, that well, was 2011, 2012. Yeah, if you buy that stock, you're rich now. But the thing that's even more impressive about this earnings is they had their first ever dividend. So now going to have dividends, Dave. So this is going to be a great stock to have for people if they want to have that blue chip dividend. So um, smart move by Meta. You know, just you know, you want to win Google. Wall, you want to win Wall Street over. <laughs> that's the other the thing. Wealth. Spread the wealth. That's the other thing. Google doesn't pay a dividend and they got more cash than anybody. You know who pays a dividend, a really nice dividend and does really aggressive stock buybacks is Dell. Do you see Dell stock? I mean, <laughs> Dell stock. Does Amazon and, pay a and, dividend? No, I think. No, I don't think so. No, they don't. They don't. They, they don't. Do they, don't. They, they don't. They don't. They don't. They, 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 they have prioritize expansion over no, but, distribution profits. Well, but it's not only that. It's not only that. They haven't had the liquidity to pay a dividend, but they do now. So it's yeah. going to be interesting to see whether or not they do. In March of 2023, Dell stock was at 36, and today it's at 86. And and the reason why is, I mean, wow, its market cap is now 60 billion. So they get, they're getting close to one x revenue. That's like <laughs> they're getting there. But um, but they basically said, hey, you buy our stock. We're gonna we're gonna pay you a fat dividend, and we're gonna do aggressive buybacks. And of course, Michael Dell is the biggest owner, so people say, "Well, uh, you're that benefits you." And he's like, "Yeah," and I'm gonna give a lot of dough to charity. So that I think is pretty awesome. So that's turned out well for yeah. you know Michael Dell's like the scene in Godfather. You know, I make my investors, my partners make money. <laughs> it's yeah. true. <laughs> play hard and play clean, as he says. Uh, Michael Dell to, makes people money. Play to win and play play hard, but play to win. What's the slogan? Play clean. Play nice. Play nice, but win. Play nice, but win. Yeah, you know, I like that. I mean, play, a, play hard and play clean is my that's philosophy. What, that's what people with integrity do, John. Yeah, they they know, play fair, play nice, and they win. The Michael Dell culture of play nice and win, or as we say, you know, play hard, play clean, is really a great philosophy. And I think Dell executives should look at their suppliers and 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 take that people who play dirty um and other people who, who do that and, and any executive should look at that and say hey you know who's playing clean who's playing dirty and that's that's a direct you know mandate i think for all businesses especially now when communities and word of mouth is so so efficient um can't fake it till you make it and i think that's important uh, but today i want to get back to this dividend thing because you look up your point about the sign of the times amazon doesn't pay dividends they they give priority of expansion over over sharing profits with shareholders meanwhile apple microsoft do give dividends now you got meta so you know back to not to bring up the old monopoly game but utilities right you know everyone wants to have a utility so the question is if you look at what's happening in the market today the big conversation is what are these big whales doing the big hyperscalers that they produce so much cash uh, and what do they give back now Related to this is a trend going on in the VC market. We reported on the Cube Pod what four or five pods ago that um, app of the combination of Facebook, Nvidia, and Amazon are, are combined more in um, percentage of investing into startups than v all the VC market combined. 
Okay, so this idea of doing that is interesting. And then you pointed out, right, right, rightfully so, that that's credits, mostly credits, not cash. So here you got the big clouds like Amazon and NVIDIA giving, ec taking equity stakes because the cost for startups to run on the cloud is so high. When they cross over and become successful with product market fit, they become customers. So it's like, here, the first hit of crack is free. Here, shoot this heroin up, take it. And then they come to the cloud. So this points to, that's a business model strategy, but this points to the fact that they're like utilities, Dave. Hyperscales and large tech firms are investing using credits, not cash, in startups for, in exchange for equity. That is a dynamic that's going on. So this is an interesting thing. Now, is that considered cost of goods sold or customer acquisition costs? Because <laughs> if you're a startup, you know, you got you want to be relying on one platform. So that's why you see Cohere and Fabric all with these deals. And that's the that's what's happening. The credit investment. Is it a credit investment or CAC? So this is interesting. This is a very interesting power that, dynamic. So is, you got these big whales, Apple, Meta, providing dividends. There are are they utilities, Dave? That's the question. Are they utilities? You know, they're 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 more than utilities. They have that utility-like dynamic, but mm -hmm. they're still like innovative tech companies. I mean, Meta's innovating. Uh, certainly Google's innovating, Amazon's innovating. Apple, everybody says, you know, was waiting for them to come out with their next innovation. You know, I don't know, Vision Pro is, is, is kind of innovative. I mean, I would say Apple's still innovating. So they're, they're cause utilities don't innovate. They just extract rent. Mm -hmm. So these guys are utility like in that they just consistently throw off cash. They're like cash flow machines, ATMs, but they innovate. So that's why their evaluations are so high. Well, when you have utilities, they're usually regulated, right? Well, that's yeah. that's probably coming for tech, and that'll screw <laughs> up everything. You know, just get let Lena Khan get in on it. I listened to a. Uh, if can I do a quick side rant? Yes, definitely. I listened to a uh, interview that she was doing, I don't know, with Sorkin or somebody a couple weeks ago. And she was just doing the same old, same old, you know, talking about extolling how in the past they have been so successful, the, F the FTC and, um, and, and the DOJ at moderating these big monopolies. And she, yet again, she rewrites history. She uses AT&T as the example. I mean, we were there, we saw the AT&T breakup. Mm -hmm. And they went into all these little baby bells and these little baby bells were, they went from big, fat, regulated, slow AT&T monopoly to little, smaller, fat, slow monopolies that were largely unsuccessful, got scooped up by all these big cable companies, Comcast and, and et cetera. And what happened to the a jewel of American innovation, Bell Labs, when that all got broken apart? And, and, and regulated. Well, what happened was that it ended up at Nokia. Nokia now owns Bell Labs. So, Z, so it was like Xerox Park. Bell Labs just went away. And so her point was, well, we created so much competition. The US, don't you remember how bad the US telecommunications system was after the AT&T breakup, how non-competitive it was? Essentially until iPhone came out. I mean, that was what changed the game anyway. <laughs> There you go. There's my rant for the day. Well, if you're listening to this podcast and you want to send in a a note, we'll read it on the Cube Pod. So send me or Dave a direct message. You want to comment on the Dave's rant? You believe it? Believe it? Or you want to disagree with it? Or me or Dave? Send us a note. Dave, we'll read it on we'll read it on the uh, on the Cube Pod. I got I got an email from someone I'll read here today. Um, they wanted their name to be anonymous, but they said, "Love what you guys are doing. What do you think about IBM, John? I heard your rant with Dave." about IBM. I think IBM is the winning hand, but I think they're light on tech, more professional services. What do you think? And what does Dave think? Yes, What's no? the question again? Well, tell me the question again. The question was, I heard your, um, loved your um, debate between you and Dave on IBM. Remember when we talked about the IBM earnings? <laughs> yeah. And uh, and I said, well, you know, I wasn't as bullish on Watson as you were. Watson oh. X, I haven't seen it. And I said, and I said, and I, and then this, so the reader says, I saw your rant with, with um, your debate with, with you and Dave, loved your takes on each side of that. I think IBM is around for the long term with AI as a tailwind, but not sure about the tech, but more, but I like the professional services angle. What are you thinking? What is Dave Yeah, thinking? so, 
I definitely, I mean, professional services, their consulting division is a, is a, is a mainstay. It's a foundational division for IBM and it gets them into so many high level conversations and solving difficult problems. I happen to think that they've got it right with Watson X. When I look at what IBM is doing in shipping relative to some of the other leaders in the marketplace in analytics and data, whether it's Databricks or Snowflake or some of the, uh, the other companies that are doing governance, some of the smaller companies like an Alation or a Calibra, uh, I see IBM as in a much, much stronger position than they were with Watson 1.0. I think the tech is matured. I think it's real. Uh, I think they've got a full stack and I think they're going to be embedding that into a lot of different places um, in, in software ecosystems. I think they're way more partner friendly. IBM embraces open source. I think Red Hat was actually turning out to be a really good acquisition. I think Arvin's got them really focused. I think their hybrid cloud strategy is working and that is, is a much more balanced equation now. It's not like everything's going into the cloud every day as it used to be. Uh, so. I think IBM's in a really good position with some significant upside, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I, I take the position of, and I like this uh, comment. Um, it was from an IBMer, by the way. So um, I like the question because one, I'm not really sold yet on the tech because IBM has a lot of tech, but okay, that's a whole different conversation. But I think the big trend that I see going on with this whole hybrid cloud and on-premise momentum is not so much to do with the fact that the old guard's catching up. It's the fact that uh, companies like IBM, uh, even some of the bigger companies, even like Amazon's got a lot of cash. IBM's been around, all these legacy companies that are still around, are if they pivot properly, they have a lot of built-in DNA and they serve customers that have been working with them to transform their computing architectures. Now, it's just happening a lot faster right now and a lot of companies have this administrative overhead that's that's been growing faster than probably some of their lean meat. So there's a lot of fat to cut. That's why there's a lot of layoffs. So I think companies like IBM that have great professional servers that know how to do transformational projects will do extremely well with just a good enough tool. And that good enough tool gets them in the market and can iterate and grow faster. So I'm saying that I like the question because it's actually the professional services of IBM combined with the good enough Watson it doesn't have to be open AI. Now, open AI is out there. I'm sure every customer will use it for some other alternative of proprietary plus open source. So IBM's in a pole position to use their resources that they're good at to help companies, their customers, do what they've been selling them for years to try to do. <laughs> and so you have a robust market for I every IBM customer. So uh, I can see IBM doing well. And plus, they got Red Hat. So... Um, companies like IBM that have installed base. That's why I like this cohesity deal we got with with uh, with Ver Veritas. That's why I'm bullish on it because their customers are now in demand. Help us more, faster. So IBM's customers and all these legacy customers are like, I got to move faster. So, so they know how to do that, and that's the key. And they just need the right tool for the job, and it doesn't have to be super great. It can be good enough to move the needle. And that that's what I think uh, the AI is. Uh, passes the muster because they have all that DNA and trying to sell the old Watson. <laughs> well, so this is what's happening with with IBM. So the old Watson is they're they're transitioning out and and churning the the base of old Watson and bringing and moving them to new Watson and they're bringing on new Watson customers. If you look at the spending data, it's actually quite remarkable. You go back, you know, let's say about a year there were far more customers, like huge number of customers, 20, 35% that were either spending less or churning. And then there was a big chunk, about 40% of the customers, and we're talking, you know, a decent size, you know, over a hundred customers in the survey, a big chunk in the, mid, in the fat middle that was just flat spending, sort of sitting on their hands. A very, very small percentage new, of new customers and, you know, decent percentage spending more, like 20%. And that was probably the new stuff. Those those numbers have started to do this, those that are spending more and coming on new. It's now like 27, 37, it's almost 40% are either new customers or spending more and the churn is going down and the spending less is going down. So we measure this by a thing called net score. Their net score a year ago was like minus 7% and today it's up to like 21%. So it's, it's like a 30% swing in spending momentum. And it's just going in the right direction. So we'll see if that's a continued trend. It's one, two, three, four quarters now it's done this. So 
they're looking pretty good. This is just the the Watson piece. And then, you know, if you look at if you look at Red Hat, that Red Hat's always been solid. Always. And so, you know, outsourced IT, you know, that doesn't look so great. You know, it's like a flatter business and that's kind of the Kindrel business. But the consulting business, I mean, it's solid. You know, again, I think I think Arvin's got him in the right direction. He he's not what he's doing is not just aspirational. It's very achievable, in my opinion. And they they made all those cuts. So they're dropping a bunch of money to the bottom line. So mm -hmm. this is the first time in a long time I've really been truly excited about IBM's prospects. I think they're back. Well, I think there's a lot of action going on. One of the things that uh, I saw on on, um, on 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 Twitter was, and then and Silicon Angle covered it, is that uh, you know there's a lot of funding happening, right? So you got um, um, the founder of Pivotal raised a bunch of cash. Um, Rob, me, remember Rob, Keep Alumni. Yeah. Raised, raised 24 million to help companies ditch their mainframes for the cloud, mechanical orchard, it's called. So um Pivotal Labs, successful company, great culture. Uh that was cool. Ninja One raised 231 million at a two billion dollar valuation. Okay, that's interesting. And of course, some uh KubeCon news. Um Kubernetes automation companies, uh, uh startup company, Weave Work shut down. So, you know, remember we talked about Kubernetes being boring, Dave? And then yeah. there's no you know, Linux is standard that no, no one really has a conference around it. Kubernetes is becoming successful. And with that, it's like it runs. So there's no need. Like, so um, there's no need for managed service anymore. It's just, it's like Linux. You just install it. So I think you're starting to see people pivoting in to that. So again, this is why I like, I, this is why I like we're in a market transition and we're going to bring Sanji Poonan on soon. And he's, when he comes on, Okay, this is the questions I'm going to ask him. We're in a market transition. Is the people going to be on the wrong side of history? What street? What side of the street are you on? The right side or the wrong side? As this wave hits, are you are you going to be driftwood or are you going to surf the wave? That's going to be the key. And I think this is his opportunity. Um, on a, on a more personal note, I'm going to ask him: Was there any other alternative? Is this musical chairs and the music? Is it stopping when you just grabbed one? Don't know. Um, these are all questions, Dave. I mean, what are you going? What are you going to ask him? You know, I want to know sort of what the impetus was for the deal um, and how you take, you know, one plus one and make it more than two. Um, and I want to think about, you know, Sanjay's all about innovation. He's not a, this is, this. he's not a consolidator, right? That's not his play. He's about investing and growing. So I want to understand how you take a company that's not growing and a company that is growing, Cohesity's not growing, oh, sorry, Veritas is not growing, Cohesity's growing. You put them together. How do you make that grow? And what do you do with the roadmaps on the different products, you know, like net backup for Veritas? I'm also interested, you know, a lot of a lot of Veritas software companies run on other people's platforms, like they run on Dell, like data domain. Are they going to continue to support that? Or because they're competitive, are they going to cut them off? I, I would imagine they're going to cut them off, but we'll see. Um, but maybe not. Um, you know, how are they going to migrate them into Cohesity? And what about the IPO? What what are what are the IPO prospects? I want to understand that as well. Okay, Dave, we got Sajay Putin, who's the CEO of Cohesity, who announced a groundbreaking merger slash one company with Veritas, combination of two great companies. One, I think Cohesity more relevant than Veritas, in my opinion. I wrote that on my on my LinkedIn. We'll get Sanjay's opinion. Sanjay Putin, Cube alumni, friend of the Cube. Um I got a lot of people saying I was too positive on my post. I thought I was kind of critical, but optimistic. Uh, congratulations. Um, welcome to the Cube Pod. First time on the Cube Pod. I love this. I've not been to the Cube Pod. I've been on the Cube. I've been on video with you, and you keep uh, innovating new forms of media. It's always a pleasure to, yeah. to talk to two of the smartest people I know in enterprise tech, Dave and John. Always good, great to talk to you. Hey, Sanjay, Sanjay, thank you. Great to have you on. So just to set this up, uh, you announced a merger with Veritas. Both companies we follow closely, data and security, storage, you know, the full transformational journey. Um, you took over Cohesity. I think you told me privately you're going to dig in and look for some organic growth, but you're no stranger to or inorganic. You did this at VMware. You had a stellar track record, SAP and VMware, where you brought in a lot of action, AirWatch. We covered those all that news here. This is a smashing uh, asset. Uh, combination and it's almost like it really is good good fit i mean i commented on i'm like okay 
you know, what's going on in this market? We're in a market transition. AI is coming. Everyone's building out infrastructure. It's not just storage. It's security. It's data. Uh, you have a great founder over there with, with Mo. He's been on the cube. Um, why this merger? Explain what happened. How did this come about? What was the history of it? And how did you get here? And, and what is it? Uh, thank you, John. Uh, yeah, listen, I, you know, I guess the way I'm built, um, you know, my, and only one gear, which is to go fast and to swing for the fences. We only want life to live and <clears throat> we have to work hard. And, um, you know, I think, think bold. I think, you know, I think leaders as leaders, it's imperative on us to set a vision that's bold. Uh, it's creative. Uh, I've always said there's sort of two vectors that should drive any company, product innovation and customer obsession. And we have the most innovative product in this category is very clear. More than the founders who created this company had a Google-esque style. They were the first to invent hyper-convert scale-out architectures. Many others, good companies, some of whom you talk to, copied our architecture, but we were the first to do it. No, no doubt, and I give more to the team enormous amount of credit. And he took that idea from what he did at Nutanix, which was bringing that hyper-convert scale-out architecture to primary data. So when I got here, I had tremendous respect for the tech. It was the best tech. Um, we were also growing go-to-market the fastest, but we kind of gone from number 25 in the space to number 15 in the space. Uh, I'm quoting IDC um, market share numbers to number eight, and we'd probably crawled our way, you know, number one. Uh, and um, just because we were growing faster, but it takes a while to kind of, there's some very sticky um, solutions that are good products. Veritas is a good product. Uh, Dell has a set of technologies, data domain, it's a good product. Uh, IBM had a product slightly older, Tivoli does its job, especially in mainframes. <clears throat> so, you know, I went around and I talked to, you know, I come in peace to all CEOs, even competitors of mine. Mm -hmm. um, and I talked to the entire industry and asked them, many of these folks I've known from SAP or VMware, they worked with me in those contexts. They're good CEOs. I respect them. I want to get a sense as to where the industry is going. And uh, John Chambers told me something when he was at Cisco. He would talk regularly to all his competitors, and he felt it was really good to get a sense of where the industry is going. And I respect him, people like Bill McDermott, John Thompson. These are people who are statesmen, they're diplomats, and I, that's how I view this industry. So as I talk to everybody in this space <clears throat> and to advisors of mine, probably one of the most interesting conversations was with Greg Hughes and with Patrick McCarter, his chair. <clears throat> this was about, I don't know, 16 months ago probably two or three months after I started, just to get a sense that I had no agenda. Where's your vision? Where's our vision? Where do you see it going? There's, there was respect for each other. I mean, partly because I'd worked at Veritas 18 years ago. And um, I respected Greg. He's been a friend of mine for 20 years. I'd known Patrick for a little less. They respected our tech. <clears throat> and I said, you know, are there ways we could think more together? Um, <clears throat> and they said, well, you know, give me some specifics. And the first proposal I had fell flat in his face, which was, how about you OEM our product and you, you took, <laughs> this was a car live. They, and, and they didn't have hardware hard. either. I don't think Veritas has hardware, do they? They, a they have that backup appliance. Yeah, but, a little bit. <clears throat> yeah. Everybody but, has an appliance. You yeah. The idea I came up was, why don't you OEM our product and you take a stake in us? You know, meaning we, you, the Veritas OEM our product and Carlisle take a stake in us. And, you know, Patrick said, why would we do this? That when the moment we announced that, no one's going to buy net backup. So that fell flat. I went left with my tail between our legs and, then the advisors to us, the bankers, came up with this structure, which is very creative. And that's where we are today. It's a very creative structure of a carve out, a debt exchange, an equity stake, a minority equity stake in us, uh, and a combination that puts us together in a, a number one spot. They're number three, we're number eight. Um, it's a very creative deal. The, both boards asked me to lead the company, which I'm very honored and humbled to do. And we're going to create an iconic company. I've talked about this. This is the, this is the way you need to think about it. We're going to create a snowflake meets Palo Alto type of company. It's data and security. So who's the one of the best modern data companies? Snowflake. Maybe Databricks too, but Snowflake's the best public company today in that space. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the best security company today? Palo Alto. And this combination will create a leader that's going to use AI and security to revolutionize. Check this out. Hundreds of exabytes. Many of our competitors deal in the single digits of exabytes. This is hundreds of exabytes of secondary data, and then eventually primary data, the things we're doing in AI and security, and a very strong uh, position in the Fortune 100, 96% of the Fortune 100. After 10 years, we'd gotten to about 44% of the Fortune 100. Very small fraction, much smaller fraction of the global 500. Most companies of our size, including other peers of us, 
we struggle getting relevance internationally. It's hard to get relevance in Japan and Australia, uh, you know, in Singapore and uh, Germany and France and UK, where the who's who in those com countries use you. Um, so, it's a com so, so it's a combination. Mm -hmm. So it's a company. So it's a, it's yeah. a merger. Okay, with with an elaborate back end, I got that. So so <clears> I get so the mergers. I get that. So but, but talk about the install base of Veritas because one of the things that jumped out at me was, and we know they have a lot of IP. Dave's got some. Uh, momentum data that he can share but to me what jumped out at me sanji was, was the was the momentum you you have okay and then you kind of crawling along like i said the market's weird right now but with veritas your install base just you just become huge i mean it's like the changes cohesity from i won't say small startup but small growing startup to massive well like literally overnight well, I think we have explained the, the order of magnitude. So the install the... base, and it's a very profitable company. I mean, we were the fastest growing, so we had speed, they had profitability, they had scale. So let's talk a little bit about that base of customers. We have 4,200 customers and about 44% of the Fortune 1. And we're an enterprise company. Many of our alternatives play more in the mid market. We are much more an enterprise company. Uh, but we didn't have a, uh, as much success, certainly not. Maybe it was 25% of the Global 500. These are the biggest, Global 500 is the 500 biggest global accounts and fortune 100 of the biggest u.s accounts so we had good success in the u.s and we're doing very well in north america competing with veritas and others but it is hard to get success in those other countries those what i call the g10 countries japan australia uk france germany and the federal sector uh, because they're sticky and when the product works so the product doesn't work you're going to get but veritas the product works they invented many of the things 30 40 years ago and and they've, they've, Greg's done a very good job as a company, keeping the product, you know, um, growing, keeping the company profitable, and many of those international customers happy. So this gives us a certainly, a, as you point out, a much faster customer acquisition speed. It lowers the customer acquisition costs. And we're both very, uh, both companies, Greg and I, if he was sitting here, he would say the same thing. We're very focused on customer satisfaction. So I can't wait when the transaction's closed to go to the top 100 customers of ours on a roadshow and tell them one simple thing. We're going to keep you happy. You don't oh, have to Sanjay. No, so, so this gives you better profitability. I got that. I'm interested yeah. in how it's going to affect growth because you're taking a fast growing company, Cohesity, and you got Veritas is, is not a fast growing company. How do you make sure this is one plus one is three and it doesn't stunt your growth? One plus one will be equal 11, David. That's what I hope. <laughs> uh, my, my hope is... Sorry to underestimate you, no, no, no. I, had to, I, had to, I had to use that line as one of my <laughs> lines that I pull out every day. Yeah, that's but, a, that's, uh, that's thinking think, big for sure. Well, I think you have to think big. Yeah. We want to create a 50 billion market cap company in this category, which has never been great. So, um, you know, the, the we usually, most of our competitors, we look at the growth of many of our competitors, the single digit growth. Look at the IDC charts, right? So we think we can be in the teens, certainly. I mean, I'd like to get that even higher. It's all pro forma at this point in time. And we've not even modeled revenue synergies as yet in the way we're thinking about it. It was very minimal. Take their growth, take our growth. I mean, if you look at the numbers that IDC had for the first half of 2023, they had them growing. Uh, single digits had us growing, you know, kind of close to 20 or north of 20%. So <clears throat> we put that together. I think you'll get a profitable growth company. And today, in the public markets value profitable growth companies. Look at the companies who went through the entire post-2021 IPO cycle was teaching everybody a simple lesson. You want to go public? You got to get profit. Yeah, yeah. Sanjay, on that point, on that point about obvious synergies, and, and there's probably more that you just alluded to, brings up a good question. How fast did this deal come together? Can you give us a sense of how fast this came together? And two, the order of magnitude of the new company combination. What's it look like in terms of skies and scope? So how fast Greg, did it come uh, together? Greg, Patrick, and I and our board started talking 15 months ago. It wasn't a it wasn't a short process because there was a lot of complexity. The lawyers who have been advising us, some of whom actually worked with me at VMware uh, during the Dell VMware spin out, and some of them actually worked even the VMware going public said this was the most complex but creative deal they've ever worked on. Yeah. And so because of all the pieces and parts of a yeah. carve out, a debt exchange, an equity raise, you know, um, there were many pieces to this, and it took time. But we were going to do this this um, project well not hastily now in the private markets it's easier to do that and prevent a leak um you know we kept this this project we kept a very tight circle of people under nda and it kept confidential john mm -hmm. for 15 months minus nine hours i think you guys got a part of the leak <laughs> <You> <laughs> I, got, I got it before. Early. <laughs> i'm about to break a story and then it, it <laughs> But it was nine hours before we were ready, and that yeah. was that was pretty miraculous. You owe me good. on that one. You owe me on uh, that one, Sanjay. 
Sanjay. <laughs> Sanjay, you owe me on that one. I could have brought. I owe earlier. you for many things, John. Yeah. But I, I, the I, least of yeah, that's. Know, the, I, the, I'll add that up and and. Uh, well, well, no, you know, you know, we're not about the page views. If we were like, you know, page view clickbait, we would have broke it. But we, we, you know, I mean, look, what, what's that going to do? It's going to screw up your launch. I got to wait. I got to. I got to ask some. I know Sanjay, you go, you're tight on time, but I got to ask some of the customer questions. I want. You're an innovation guy, so I want to know how you're thinking about the innovation roadmap for cohesive you know, data protect. And at the same time, the net backup roadmap for Veritas. You, you have experience in managing complex portfolios and yeah. SAP, VMware, way more complicated than you've got here. But how should we think about those? What yeah, learnings think, can you bring? David, you're absolutely right. This is not my first rodeo to a acquisition. SAP uh, acquiring business objects, there was some overlap. VMware buying Airwatch, there was some overlap. You know, you have to deal with overlap, but here's how I think about it. There are certain use cases, like a jigsaw puzzle, there are certain use cases we don't do today. Let's start with those, cohesively. Net backup is a great backup product on top of, for example, data domain. I'm told that about 60% of the Dell base that uses backup uses them. Yes. The calls was to Michael Dell and his team, Jeff Clark, Arthur Lewis, that we will absolutely support net backup <clears throat> on top of data. We don't do that use case. We absolutely support it because customers want, it's called a disaggregated use case, backup on top of somebody else's storage. Yep. Okay. We don't do things like backup to tape. There's some customers who still want backup tape. That backup will do No worries, okay? Guess what, now let's go. That's on the far end of what one might consider. There's certain proprietary databases we haven't built. Like some customers want, a retailer wants an Informix database. And some other financial services we want Sybase. They've got 500 adapters. Incredible, we want that. That's beautiful IP. They've got, I think, some order of 1,500 or 2,000 patents. We want that IP. They invented many things in backup 30 years ago, that's going to be very powerful uh, in our IP portfolio. Then let's go to the forward thinking side of things. They acquired a company called HubStore uh, that does a lot of the SaaS applications. They do Google Workspace, they do Salesforce. We don't do that today. So some senses, you know, a cavalier approach might say, well, Coesity did the sort of these, these, I'd say the core use cases better than everybody else. Yes, that is data protection of virtual machines, many databases, NAS files and M365. Those four use cases we do very well. And we win because of speed, scale, and simplicity and security. So that we're going to do. And in some of the new things that we're doing AI, those are extremely complementary. So we're going to be talking a lot more about generative AI. And by the way, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and now NVIDIA are super excited. You're going to hear more about that in coming weeks. Stay tuned. Our generative AI capabilities for being able to search for data. See, most often people think about this space like a tape. In the old case, it was a tape. Okay, now it's actually this, but it still feels like a tape because you compress and dedupe the data and put it there. We're going to make that tape look like a lake. And once you can search that secondary data, just like it's, you could search Snowflake and Databricks, it becomes gold. That's our vision. No one's cracked that. The ability to manage, secure, and provide insights on data now as a leading player with the scale we have, 1.6 billion in revenue, 1.3 billion in ARR, yeah. hundreds of exabytes, 96% of the Fortune 1, 180% of Global 500. We're just getting started. Sanjay, my last question for you. First of all, thank you for coming on our Cube Pod. Uh, we rarely have guests, but not, when we get great news, we'll bring our, our those guests on. Um, our friend, joint friend John Chambers, once said, "We talked about this on our last Cube Pod, Dave and I. Market transitions are critical for companies to make. You got to make the transition when the market transitions." And John was huge on transit market transitions. We're in one right now. I hear headlines like data protection, um, storage, describing you guys. What is the new combination, Cohesity, Veritas? What is the category? What do you guys call yourself? I saw security, I saw data. You said Snowflake meets uh, Palo Alto Networks. What category are you in? What category do you want to create? Or what, what is your vision for what you will be? What's the new bumper sticker for Cohesity with this combination as it unfolds? Okay, I'll give it to you. Simple. The category is AI-powered data security management. Data security management is the core category. AI power is how we differentiate. Here's our mission, okay? That's the category. Here's the mission of the company. We protect and secure the world's data and allow companies to get insight into that data. The largest organizations in the world rely on us for their business resilience, not just cyber resilience, all resilience. So I think that that's, you take that category and that mission, you can build a great company. Now the question is, when you come back to data, you think of it like an iceberg. Primary data is the top of the iceberg. Companies like Snowflake, Databricks, 
or unstructured data like emails in OneDrive or whatever have you. The moment that data ages, it goes to the bottom of the iceberg. That's called secondary data. Nobody has created a company that can manage, secure, and provide insights in that secondary data. And there's thousands of exabytes in the bottom <laughs> of the iceberg. That's final, company. final, final question. I have one more popped in my head. So I, I, mean, I got answer. one more too, if you, I can. All right, okay, keep and going. You, I'm, you, I'm, happy. You, I'm, just, I'm you, happy to do it. You didn't answer it before. Co <laughs> what, what cohesity before the merger was how big? And now with the combined nation, what is, I mean, combined merger, what does it look like in terms of size of people under your management? What's yeah, I mean, we'll, what does we'll, it turn into from this to that? We are uh, about, a combination is going to be about 1.6 billion. About a third of that comes from Cohesity, and two thirds of that comes from um, Veritas. That's mm -hmm. kind of the way to think about that a pro forma, um, you know, revenue. Profitability comes almost significantly when we were approaching profitability cash flow, they were very profitable. Growth rate just comes primarily from us. They're also, they weren't declining. I think some of the, not you, but some of the other reporters said they were declining and lose. No, they're, they're growing, not as fast as us, but they were growing. So we will uh, make sure that that combination is a rule of 40 company. That's what we're gonna do. None of our competitors are rule of 40. This is gonna be a rule of 40 company we go out, which is gonna be great. And you, Why stop at 40, make it 80? Yeah, well, <laughs> so okay. So you go. Oh, hold on, hold on, from... hold on, hold on. I one more qualification. How many employees? Hey, let Dave employees get in. All right. Hold fine. on. I want to get. That, I want to get the data. So one point. I got the. I'm data. used to it, Sanjay. Em employees. How many employees from cohesive? Nearly over five thousand employees. You know. Um. You know. Uh, that's kind of roughly how we we okay. probably end up. But we're still working that through. All right. All right, Dave, okay. Go. So you go from a half a billion to now. Let's call it one and a half, one and a half one point six billion. 3. You said. Okay. One point six. So that puts you into new a new club. <laughs> My my question is the IPO question, valuation around seven billion. Do I do I have that right? Is that something? For you... this, but I mean that's for it's a private round, right? So um, yeah. I mean my view on the valuations we looked at that was valuations of pieces of of paper uh, are in a private round. The most important valuation is what you get in the public market. Yep. And I'd rather point this company towards a fifteen billion dollar valuation. We go out. 20, 25, and then keep executing rather than be greedy in this private. It's all paper. So all these guys who went and got overinflated valuations during the heyday, they're all going through down rounds now. You want to have a linear growth for your valuation so that people steadily, I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm playing this for the long term. I want to create a $15 billion, $50 billion, uh, as do all of our team. We want to create that. We then we want to go from 50 to 100. So from our perspective, we were modest as to how we thought about valuation now because we were planting for the future. And then the IPO question, listen, our bankers tell us this year, last year was a tough year. Only three went out, Clavio, Instacart, and Arm. And 2022 was a dry year. I think 2024 is going to be an uncertain, maybe a tepid year. Very few that will go out. And, you know, there may be one, two months to get out, maybe April and then July or August. And then there's the election. So all the great companies like Databricks and Stripe, I think are all thinking next year after the election. So if we're going to wait, my view is why not bulk up and then go out? So that's kind of the way the calculus was, if we're going to wait and 2024 is a dry to tepid year and nobody wants to be the first to go out, let's get bigger. Let's bulk up, close this transaction, hopefully by the end of the year. And then we'll be ready when the markets open up. And there's another factor I want to tell you in IPOs. Our bankers told us there's about 800 companies that are between 50 and 500 million trying to go out public. 800, okay? That's in the category we were. And some of our competitors are in that, that category too. Well, as the, as 40, how many over? How many over a billion? Exactly, I'm going there. Forty companies that are over 1.5 billion that want to go up. I mean, it's a much more rare air. And then you take inside those 40 who are rule of 40. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, it's very so. We get to be a much different company as we go on. That's the calculus. Like if you're going to wait, if it's a rainy day, mm -hmm. you stay inside, fix your house, and then wait for a sunny day before you sell yeah. the house. So let me show sure I got this. So I love I love what you said. You're at seven billion dollar valuation. You you want to go out at let's say fifteen to twenty. So your 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 private investors get a nice bump up, and then you want to take it to up north of twenty to fifty billion. So the guys that get in on IPO, the little guys, are actually going to make some money. So I like the way you think, Sanjay. I hope all investors listen. This is yeah. what are we doing this primarily for our employees and our customers. Shareholders are important. Our employees, are, yeah. but we're doing this company for our employees and our customers. Okay. Never lose track of that. Our employees innovate every day. They work hard serving customers and our customers show faith in us. So I always start there. Shareholders are important. And by the way, our employees are all shareholders. But I never, I, I go back, who do I serve every day? My employees. I am a servant leader. 
So who wants my every employee to know that the CEOs are the, at the bottom of the pyramid, it's not the top down. But then we also serve our customers. And if we have that mindset, I mean, these are just numbers we're throwing around now, like yeah. 15, 50. These are aspirational. I hope we get there. But uh, that's, you know, how, look at, you, you've talked to Nikesh Arora. Like, what, look what he's done at Palo Alto. I mean, he's yeah. taking that company. It's probably 20, 30 billion. It's not north of 100. Yeah. You know, look at what Frank Slootman, uh, now he, uh, you know, is more recent, but he took it, he's taken it to 75. Yeah. So these are great CEOs I respect. And that's why you should think about this as a snowflake. Yeah. It's Palo Alto. George Kurtz, CrowdStrike, another. Yeah. Uh, he's he's done a, a great strike. It's seventy-five billion right now. So yep. you could you could say maybe it's a it's a CrowdStrike makes no a CrowdStrike makes no data. Yeah, there you go. Right, you can pick any analogy. It's data and security, and you think of your largest data company, Snowflake or Databricks. Think of your largest security companies, Palo Alto or CrowdStrike. That's who we're creating here. Well, your integration comes down to execution, right? Good, good combination. Great. Well, you want to say this. humble and hungry, and let me tell you just one quick lesson on that before we wrap up. You know why most M and A's feel? People, not all these product things that you discuss, we'll, we'll figure out. Somebody decides, I don't want to stay at this company. They have an ego or something, and that's my job. I got to make sure the best talent among those 5,000 people, I'll work hard for them. I want to make sure this team has the best. And if we don't have the best people, we're going to recruit. We'll recruit from our competitors. We're getting emails from competitors who want now to join us because they're saying, I want to be part of the top company in the space. I'm working, I'm number four, five, six, or seven. I want to be number one. Great. Join up. We've got customers of our competitors reaching us saying, please give us a briefing. We'd like to know what you're doing. So I just we just need to stay humble and hungry. Yeah. And remember, serve your employees, serve your customers, you build a great company. Well, we're in a market transition, uh, looking good in that rarefied air, the 800, 800 to 40. He, companies above 1.5 million about to go public. Uh, great combination. We're a big fan of what Veritas's legacy was and is coming, becoming. And, and obviously, we've been following you. Um, great transaction. We're looking forward to hearing more about what's valuations, what are those synergies that you're that will probably pop out of nowhere. I'm, I'm sure you're going to bump into a bunch, and as you always do. Sanjay, thank you so much for coming on the Cube Pod. Great to see you, and, Sanjay. And our weekly podcast where we extract the signal from the noise. Me and Dave uh, riff a little bit more casual, but appreciate breaking news here from your company. Congratulations to you and the entire team. Thank you, John. Dave, always a pleasure to talk right. to two smart, hey. very smart uh, journalists in the industry. Hey, best of luck, Sanjay. Thank you, guys. All, right. All of us. Dave, Sanjay Poonin, what a cute friend. Um, we were nice to him. I thought we were pretty strong uh, a little bit at the beginning, but uh, you know, really good data, Dave. You know, 1.6 billion, we got some numbers out of them. We got, uh, I love the stats from the bankers about the public. That gives us some good puzzle pieces for our analysis. Um, but look at, I mean, this is a transition market. You mentioned John Chambers, um, really, really laying down the vision. I mean, he Snowflake and, and Palo Alto Networks, kind of two uh, Silicon Valley companies. Obviously, he's using them as you know stalking horses for valuation and vision. Interesting perspective. I mean, if you look at CrowdStrike and Palo Alto's valuations, Dave, they're through the roof. I mean, it's incredible execution. So, um, yep. again, it's going to come back down to integration, as as you know, he says people. But really interesting perspective from Sanji. Sounds super excited, and uh, you know, I mean. 1.6, I mean, it's not huge numbers, but better than where they were probably with Cohesity. And over 5,000 employees now. I mean, Cohesity had, it was a tiny company. European, Asia Pacific presence, instant global player. So it's going to be interesting is, does the tech translate? That's going to be, does the tech translate? Can they, can they mine the install base? Can they drive this through the install base? Uh, can they keep the people from leaving or motivating them to stay. I'm sure they got some complicated stock option grants and some sort of equity and bonus incentives for management. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I kind of like this on paper. I think it's got a lot of headroom and it sounds like they didn't really dig into the synergies from what he was saying. 15 months, kind of a short time period, mostly what, back end structure. What I liked was what he said about the customer view that, that the Veritas products they're going to continue to support them on things like data domain, which is owned by Dell. Um, that says to me they're doing the right thing because there's a good business there and you don't want to disrupt that. So it seems, it sounds like, and, and he's right about, I forgot about what he said about Veritas. They got like one of everything because they've been around for so long. You remember Veritas used to be the gold standard of storage software. And then, you know, they went private equity. They kind of disappeared for a while. They made some investments and then, you know, they, they, they say they went sort of dark. You didn't really hear much from them from a marketing standpoint. So it's interesting. I mean, 
He said this is, was going on for 15 months. So who knows, maybe those other, you know, rumors about Cisco and IBM and Rubrik were all bullshit and just maybe, but who knows, but the smoke this fire. So, but anyway, it doesn't matter. This is what they're doing. He's always, the other thing is they're taking on some debt. They probably got a couple billion dollars in debt, which is, you know, 2 billion on a, on a 1.6 billion. That's, um, Hundred and Look at, what twenty five percent? Sanjay, Sanjay, revenue, he, and we trust him. I mean, like he, he knows he brought up the scoop. I had the scoop at you know twenty four thousand yeah, in but, advance. I could have dropped that, but. but but my my only point there is they got to they got to chop down that debt a little bit before they go public. I would think, you know, and he's I think he was signaling they need time to do that. Um, I know a lot of people are excited about IPOs this year, uh, but it sounds like he's going to wait. You know, you th think about companies like Databricks, Arctic Wolf's another one that we've been predicting is going to go public for a while. So well, we'll see. I mean, maybe 2024 will be a quiet year, but um, who knows? Second half could be gangbusters with all this AI hype. People might want to jump in if they're ready. Yeah, I do. I love it. I think it's going to be one of those things where, you know, he's going to be a classic candidate for IPO. Can they get the numbers up? I, I've always liked Veritas as a company. They got a very loyal base. It's like I like I was commenting about IBM earlier. You know, they're they have customers that are they've been serving. Now you just introduce a new element called AI enabled, as Sanjay put it. Every company is transitioning, and it's an opportunity for whoever has got who's got the bold vision and the ability to execute. Okay, to get in there and get it done. So we'll see. Sanjay's got the chops. Can he mobilize the crew? He's obviously telling his people, I'm at the bottom of the pyramid. It's all about execution. Um, <laughs> he's on the wave. We'll be watching. Uh, <laughs> we'll be watching. Dave, again, great, great pod. Bring in the guests. I love bringing in guests. Just, you know, as we wrap up, I'm reading some of the news here from the Wall Street Journal on my online version. Exclusive Amazon Prime Video gets exclusive NFL playoff game next season. I don't um, think it hit my paper yet. I'll have to, I'll have to, I read it online too, you know. Dave, that's, my that, Dave, that, that's, that's today's news, not yesterday's news. You see, you're reading yesterday's news, Dave. That's, no, I read that's, online that's, too. I that's, from both. Yesterday. that's from yesterday. <laughs> Save the trees, Dave. Save the trees. It must be an East Coast thing. Uh, so so NFL, have a great weekend. Super Bowl party. Everyone yeah, enjoy. listening. Uh, hit us up. It will, if you want to, got a question you want to ask me and Dave, send us an email or DM us, WhatsApp us. We'll read it on the pod. And if you want your name to be read, say, I want my name to be read. If not, no big deal. You want to go anonymous? We will read it. It's, it's been one of the most requested things I've been getting is, hey, can I comment? There's no comments on pods. Well, here is your chance. Let us know if you have any questions. We will read it in the air. If it's good. If it sucks, we won't. So ask good questions. Uh, feel free to uh, chime in. Dave, we'll see you next time. Have a great weekend. Thanks, everybody. That's episode 46. Game. Go to siliconangle.com, cube.net. Check out the cubeai.com. We're adding more and more stuff every day, multimodal search results of the cube conversations. Every single word of the cube, cube pod is now indexed into the AI, and soon there will be a bot for you to use. Check it out. Have a great weekend.